I'm introducing to you a film dealing with one of the most vital social problems of our time, housing. Because I'm director of housing for the city, I shall refer more particularly to the work in Liverpool, one of the world's greatest trading centres. The city is rightly proud of its two cathedrals, its civic buildings, and those which house its commercial and industrial undertakings. Many must have experienced the thrill which a journey along the great waterfront affords. The world-famed docks and the many and varied industries give employment to thousands of men and women. But in the background, there are the congested and worn-out dwellings in which many of the workers are compelled to live. This problem of the slums is common to most of our large towns, and because disease and misery breed where such conditions exist, a nationwide campaign has been entered upon. It is not sufficient for our workers to enjoy modern hygienic conditions at their places of employment, and the purpose of this film is to show what is being done to provide better houses for the citizens of Liverpool. This map will give you an impression of the magnitude of the slum clearance programme to which the council is already committed, and also of the redevelopment which is taking place in the older residential areas of the city. It is difficult to imagine the conditions under which many are living, but such houses as these are being demolished daily. With the passing of the first post-war housing act, Liverpool renewed its warfare against bad housing conditions. This has continued incessantly, and today, not only are new estates being developed on the outskirts of the city, some a mile square, but replanning and redevelopment of areas, 40, 60, 90 acres in extent, is being carried out. The slums are gradually disappearing, giving way to new development in and around the city. The foundation stone at the entrance to Gerard Gardens was laid in 1935 by the Right Honourable Sir Kingsley Wood, then Minister of Health, at the inception of the first great redevelopment scheme in this country. The scheme will take five years to complete. You will not be surprised to learn that since the war, over £20 million has been expended by the Council on Housing. Myrtle Gardens is a scheme of 344 flats, built on the site once occupied by the Botanic Gardens, the Rendezvous of Liverpool Society for the first 34 years of the last century. The principal courtyard was the site of the Church of the Holy Innocents, which served the Liverpool orphanage. Here there are two, three and four bedroom flats, each fully equipped with hot water, baths and a small kitchen scullery where many important household duties can be performed expeditiously and easily. There is plenty of light everywhere and the decoration has been carried out in bright colours, a pleasant contrast to the drabness of the insanitary properties from which the present tenants have moved. Each flat is provided with a gas washing boiler and facilities for washing clothes. But at Carroll Gardens, tenants can take their washing to a specially gas-heated drying room and call for it in half an hour, ready for ironing. What a boon on a wet day. Children of all ages are well provided for. At Myrtle Gardens, there are over four acres of open space. Many a happy hour is spent in the playground. Where these children used to live, the only open space was the road. And you can imagine the anxiety of parents with the dangers of present-day traffic. These playgrounds are valuable amenities, the keep fit movement in practice. This aerial view gives an excellent idea of the attractive layout of these flats. You have seen how energetically the Housing Committee is discharging its responsibility for housing the workers of the city. May I give you just a few figures to illustrate what has already been done. By 1914, over 12,000 insanitary houses had been demolished and 11,000 persons had been rehoused by the corporation. Now the Housing Committee accommodates a population of 122,000 persons. On the outskirts of the city, over 29,000 houses have already been erected. Here provision is made for the newly married, for aged couples, and even for families of 10 and 12 persons. These houses have every modern amenity and will always be a valuable asset to the city. The outer areas have been planned to give adequate open space in addition to the twelfth of an acre which nearly every tenant has and can cultivate as a garden. This is Greenway on the Heighton Farm Estate, where you see a children's playground and a rest garden for the old people. The Dovecote Estate of over 250 acres lies on each side of the Liverpool Prescott Road. It was here seven years ago that the first cottages for aged persons were built, a successful experiment which has since been repeated on all estates 
subsequently developed. The 3,000 3, houses are grouped around a communal centre in which every necessary amenity is provided. On these estates, there are churches, schools, baths, libraries, such as this at Norris Green, which is a self-contained building serving over 7,000 families. In some cases, on the smaller estates, the public library and meeting hall are built over the shops. In all cases, a veranda runs the length of the shopping centre so that tenants on the estates are protected on the wettest days and can seek out the best bargain. The building of flats is not wholly restricted to the more densely populated districts of the city. There are some who are unwilling to undertake the responsibilities of cultivating a garden. They prefer to live in flats such as these on Muirhead Avenue, one of the main arterial roads. Here too are being erected flats for single persons. Perhaps Speak is the most interesting development yet undertaken by the city. It is to be a separate community unit in which will reside those engaged in the many industries which are settling in this district of the city. Varying levels often offer difficulties in development, but at long view, where part of the estate is much below the main traffic road, the effect is very pleasing. In a few years, the embankment to the main road will be gay with goss and other flowering shrubs. Though this estate is over six miles from the pier head, the houses are eagerly sought after and make very attractive homes. I know from personal contact with the tenants who move into the new dwellings how much they appreciate the amenities provided for them, especially when they come from insanitary properties. Hot and cold water laid on, wireless plugs, and a variety of methods for cooking. Mrs. Greaves, who lives in Myrtle Gardens, prefers to cook by gas, but I'll let her tell you all about that. As one who has derived considerable benefit through the work of the Housing Committee, I think I should be entitled to speak about the difference it has made in the life of an ordinary housewife like myself. The difference between slum property and this house and its surroundings you can see for yourself. But a big difference is in the amount of time saved by not having to clean out the house, making it fit for human beings to live in. That's what I had to do in the last house, but here we have everything which makes life easier. Take this kitchen, for instance. Cooking is quick and easy with a modern gas cooker. I can set it at any speed and leave the meal preparing, knowing it will be perfectly cooked whilst I am carrying on with some other work. Washing and ironing used to be a nightmare, but with gas coppers and irons, it's a pleasure. We always had to rely on the fire before to boil the water, to heat the irons, but now it's just the turn of a tap. All these appliances are worked by gas. It's clean, and what's more, it's cheap. Before we came here, we couldn't save a penny. The kids were always ill, the clothes were worn out before their time. Gas cost me a shilling a week, and coal three and ten a week. The cost of living is low, and our home is perfect. The struggle to make both ends meet has ceased, and we are all perfectly happy and healthy. You have seen a little of the work already accomplished. It is the council's intention that the slum shall be cleared and overcrowding be abated as rapidly as possible. But that is not the whole problem of housing. There is the responsibility for those who cannot find accommodation, the newly married, that they may start life aright, the large family, the spinster, whom nobody seems very anxious to accommodate. And then there are the aged citizens, who have fulfilled all their obligations to the state and who are entitled to comfort and happiness in the eventide of life.